Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, gosh, happy Monday. It, I must say it's not my normal day of drinking, but uh, I do have a little glass of wine here. So I hope you've all got something Greek. Um, yep, yeah, my name is Matthew. I'm the buyer for Greece at the Wine Society. And I'm very aware that 45 minutes to do an entire workshop on one country um, is pretty difficult, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, I am going to be missing out, obviously, huge amounts. Um, I feel like I've put together a presentation which will highlight kind of the most important parts, the major grape varieties, major regions. And for those new to Greek wine, hopefully you should be able to look at a bottle and, and figure out what's inside. So hopefully this will be useful for everybody. Um, and as Catherine said, please feel free to drop questions in the chat, but hopefully I should answer everything as I go. Right, I'm just gonna share my screen because you know I love a good presentation. So here we go. I put this earlier and um, put it together earlier. Um, and of course, with all important topics such as Greece, you've got to start with a bit of a history lesson. Um, so of course, you know, wine has played a hugely important role in the history of Greek culture, arguably more so than any other. And for ancient Greeks, wine was not just a drink, but it was a celebration of life itself. And it was a catalyst for the growth that brought the world democracy, philosophy, and of course, one of the world's, well, some of the world's greatest wines. Wine was so important for the ancient Greeks that they even worshipped it in the form of a god. So Dionysus, who was one of the 12 major Greek deities, he was the son of Zeus and a human called Smelly. So he was actually the closest to humans of all of the deities. Um, and so in a way, um, wine is almost the link between the mortal world and the gods. So obviously hugely important. Now, viticulture in Greece, I'm just trying to move on my slide. I'm not sure if I can, oh, there we go. Viticulture in Greece is believed to date back to the third millennium BC likely starting in Crete, thanks to its locality to Egypt, who had been cultivating the vine for centuries before, although possible routes through Asia Minor are also possible. So although the Greeks were not the first to produce wine, they were certainly the first to have a culture around it. They were the first to have wine writers, they were the first to have sommeliers, you name it, they were probably the first. Wine played a major part in religious festivals, cultural events, and of course, symposiums where groups of men would discuss important topics whilst being regularly topped up with wine, of course. And this practice is probably best known in Plato's symposium, if there are any philosophers out there. I studied philosophy at university, so I, I def I've definitely read that, I promise. Um, wine consumption was slightly different back then, though, than, than to what it is now. Um, grapes were typically left in the sun after harvest for approximately 10 days, when, where they gained intensity and sweetness. And the wine was typically cut with water, often seawater, which sounds pretty disgusting to me, um, by a ratio of roughly one part wine to three parts water. Drinking was encouraged, but drunkenness was to be avoided. Part of the host's job was, of course, to keep people topped up and ensure conversation flowed, but also keeping an eye on anyone becoming disorderly and spoiling conversation. So I'm sure we all know a few people who could use one of those. The Greek writer Hesiod is arguably the first person to write about wine in the 7th century BC, who discusses harvest dates, production methods, and negative effects of oxida oxidation. So proves that not only did the Greeks know a lot about wine, they also knew how to make it better, to increase quality, and of course, know what causes wines to spoil. This is supported by the arrival of what is believed to be the world's first wine legislation dating back to the 5th century BC, which was governing the wine trade. The large ceramic amphora, which were used for transporting wine, were sealed by the state's regulators to guarantee authenticity, and each region had their own distinctly shaped amphora. And uh, this allowed <clears throat> this has allowed historians and archaeologists to track and trade um, to trade to track trade routes um, of the ancient Greeks, Greeks through Egypt to the Black Sea to the Danube and Tuscany. So as a way of tracing wine's history through Greece, it's far better with these amphorae because they, they don't disintegrate over time, whereas oak barrels have been harder to trace the, the, 
the root of oak barrels and their use throughout Europe. Flavorings were often used in wine, so the wines of Thassos, uh, which is believed to be where the first wine legislation originated, were known for their florality, thanks to the addition of rose petals during fermentation. And the addition of flavors to wine is one that survives to this day with the use of pine resin in Retsina, although whether that's a good thing or not, I'll leave you to decide. Um, Greece's wine trade was at its peak in the 6th to the 4th centuries BC, but after the Roman conquest in 146 BC, Athens was no longer the superpower in the Mediterranean, and instead pretty much all trade went towards Rome and southern France. Times became slightly worse during the thousand year reign of the Byzantine Empire from 330 AD, where the rise of monotheism and Christianity across Europe put an end to idolatry and the worshipping of Dionysus. And viticultural land across Greece was given to the church and winemaking was practiced by scholars, by priests and really only just well-heeled individuals. After the sacking of Constantinople by the Ottoman Empire, the Greek wine trade was basically put on halt and after their defeat destroyed the majority of viticultural land across Greece as they retreated. So it really wasn't until the 1970s or the 1980s following two world wars of which Greece was obviously heavily involved and its own bloody civil war that viticulture and viniculture really got back on track with the rise of the small producers. Right, that was a very quick whistle stop tour of the history of Greek wine. Let's get into modern day. I apologize this map isn't great but I am an absolute lover of Google Maps and for anyone studying wine I do think that this satellite view gives you so much information which is just free to kind of absorb. It's difficult to generalize about a climate and geography of such a large country which has so many kind of distinctive factors but I'm going to give it a go. So of course the main features probably that you'll see hopefully you can see my my arrow are the three seas that surround Greece. So you've got the Ionian Sea over to the west, you've got the Libyan Sea which kind of curls around the bottom of Crete here. So you've got Crete, this large island which is the largest island of Greece down in the south. Crete's pretty much split into two from this mountain range that goes through the middle. You've got the incredibly hot southerly side um, with all the hot winds coming up through from Africa. And then you've got the kind of wetter, cooler northern side, which is where the majority of the grape growing is. And then you've got the Aegean Sea to the east here. Um, now Greece is home to just over 3,000 different islands, but only 63 are actually inhabited. The most important islands in terms of viticulture are Kefalonia, which is over here to the west, just west of Patras, for those that can't see uh, my little arrow. Crete, of course, just mentioned down here in the south. Santorini, which is just north of Crete here. And uh, Samos, which is just there, which is very famous for its sweet muscats. As you might be able to tell from this map, Greece is an incredibly mountainous country. It's actually the third most mountainous country in Europe behind Switzerland and Spain, with its main feature being this mountain range here. Again, hopefully you can see my arrow which is the Pindus mountain range. Uh, this is an extension of the European Alps and they curl basically from the northwest to the southeast of Greece and then down through the Peloponnese as well. And obviously this is a huge mountain range and so it's difficult to generalize but typically it means that the west side of this mountain range is quite wet and quite cool and the eastern side is very very hot and very very dry. There are three main plains in Greece. So you've got Thessaly here, just south of Larissa. Um, you've got Macedonia up here outside Thessaloniki. And then you've got Thrace over here, but we won't go into Thrace because not that much wine's made there. Um, and so really, they're the only areas of fertile land across the entirety of Greece. The rest, as you can tell, is just mountains, which is great for winemaking because as we all know grapes do better in infertile soils where they can you know really struggle um, and it's great for the quality of high quality grapes because as a necessity the kind of vineyards have been exiled to the best terroirs up in the mountains rather than on the plains where they'll make the crops. I think there's even a, a, a Greek saying where it says if you can plant anything plant it, if you can't plant a vineyard. And so typically vineyards are pushed higher up 
into the hills where there's all that lovely difficult soil and all that amazing wine. The majority of the soils are limestone or sandstone or some sedimentary rock um, and there are two major exceptions, well certainly of interest. Um, there's Santorini at the bottom, which I've mentioned, which is predominantly volcanic. And then there is Nausa, which is up here in the north, just west of Thessaloniki, which has quite a lot of clay. And so I'll look in a bit more detail into both of those in just a little bit. Land under vine in Greece is roughly 110,000 hectares, which produces roughly 2.9 million hectolitres of wine a year, which sounds like a lot but that's roughly half the size of an average Bordeaux crop. So for an entire country to produce half the amount of Bordeaux is bonkers. I think it makes it the 17th largest producer of wine in the world, but um, you know, the majority is, well, I like to think fine wine and there's not too much bulk wine. What bulk wine there is, is typically done by cooperatives. Right, the grape varieties. I'm well aware that there are well over 300 uh, grape varieties, certainly unique grape varieties in Greece, um, but slightly time limited. So I'm going to be focusing on four. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully those four are of interest to you. Um, I do think that they're probably the best grapes in Greece at this current moment in time. That's not to say that there are other grapes, you know, in the next few years, which, uh, which will be better. But I think these, as an introduction, are the best ones to, to focus on. So we'll start with the white grapes. Um, I know what you're going to say, that's not a white grape. Um, it is actually, it's, uh, it's Moschka Filaro, uh, which is actually, it's a pink skinned grape variety, but it's typically vinified as a white wine. So there's hardly any skin maceration. And so the color doesn't come through too much. Um, it produces amazingly fresh, aromatic, typically quite low in alcohol white wines. Um, and although similar in style and the name Moscow, which derives from Moscato, meaning aromatic, and although similar style, these, this grape has nothing to do with Muscat or Gewurz Traminer. They're different families. This is from the Filero family. Um, and there are, I think, three other kind of clones um, of Moschka Filero. Um, and so, yeah, the most famous area for Moschka Filero is a place called Mantinia, which is down in the Peloponnese. It's a, a PDO where this is the main grape variety. And blends need to be up 85% of Moschka Filaro to be PDO Mantinia. Um, society members, who I'm sure you all are, um, may know of Semeli, who produce uh, a lot of Moschka Filaro. Uh, they've been a society favorite for quite a while, uh, and they do a PDO Mantinia, which I think is 100% Moschka Filaro, um, which you know, is absolutely wonderful. And you may have seen more recently, we've got the white on gray Moschka Filaro from Mitrevelas, which is equally lovely. Um, I'm not really supposed to be telling people about wines that are upcoming, but I'm going to do that anyway. Um, so in a couple of weeks time, we'll be releasing our first ever society own label Greek white, which is produced for us by Semeli. Um, and so that is, it's not a PDO wine. So it's a blend of 55% Moschka Filaro and 45% Roditis. Uh, and that'll be coming out in a couple of weeks time. So I highly recommend you look out for that. Um, but yeah, typically unoaked, fresh, attractive styles of white wine. They do make sparkling as well for, with Moschka Filaro, but I've not tried any actually, uh, and it's pretty small fry. Right, Asirtko. So Asirtko is arguably, I don't think there's any argument in it whatsoever, uh, Greece's finest white grape. Um, it produces wines which are full-bodied, high in alcohol, high in acidity, very textural and um, wines often have a pH of below three, which, you know, that's like Van Clare um, kind of levels of acidity. It's, it's incredibly acidic, um, despite typically being grown in incredibly hot climates like Santorini, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail later. And like the name suggests, I mean, Assyrtico, these are, these are assertive wines. They are full, intense and pretty heady. They're not too aromatic like Moschka Filaro, but they, really wacky around the chops. It's very resistant to disease and drought, hence why Santorini is the perfect home for it. And the wines are typically fermented in, this, in stainless steel and aged on the lees for long periods of time to gain complexity. 
some examples are aged in oak, but it's you know it's not certain that that Asiotigo has a good affinity with oak. Personally, I prefer the styles that are unoaked. Um, and I know that we've had a few questions already about why we don't stock Asiotigo. Uh, we have done in the past and we will do in the future. Uh, it is very, very expensive. It's made in tiny quantities, um, as I'll get onto in just a minute, but we do have two Asiotikos hopefully coming out next year. Um, yeah, I'd like to get some in sooner, but unfortunately, you know, with with COVID, it's been difficult to to source new stuff. Um, but patience is what I ask for. <laughs> um, you will be happy to know that I've got some to in my glass here. So sorry. <laughs> Hopefully, you've got some as well. Right. Let's move on to the red grapes. So the first one I'd want to look at is Ayurgitiko. You can all try that at home. Ayurgitiko. Um, I'm not Greek. I just uh, I practice. Um, but you'll be happy to know that in the UK, certainly amongst the trade, it's often known as, as St. George. And so if you see a, a Greek wine with St. George written on the label, that is Ayurgitiko. Uh, it's a very versatile red grape. It typically produces quite deeply coloured, full-bodied, quite attractive, sensual, spicy red wines, which have a really high affinity to new oak. And so a lot of the time you'll see these wines quite heavily oaked. And to be honest, it's quite hard not to like really well-made Ayurgitiko. It's just very plump and sensuous and, and really delicious. Um, but unlike Asiritiko, it's hugely virus prone. Um, in fact, I think it was only in 2017 that the first virus-free clone was produced. And so hopefully that means that quality will be going up and up and up over the, 10, over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, the vine typically has average vigour, but can produce very high yields, so the vines do need to be stressed in order to produce the best examples. Um, and the Nemea PDO is, is where it's home in the Peloponnese, which we'll look at in just a minute. It's where the majority of Ayurgitiko is, uh, and it's where it named, earned the nickname Blood of Hercules, because it's believed that Hercules came from Nemea. And it's the major part in most cross-regional blends, and the Nemea PDO is 100% Ayurgitiko. Um, we've got a few at the moment. Again, the Mitra Velas, we have their red on black Ayurgitiko, which is an amazing introduction to the grape. It's very, very accessible, super plump, really nice. So if you've not tried it before, I think that's a really good place to start. Um, but we've got a, a, a finer example coming hopefully again next year. Um, so patience. Okay, let's move on to our fourth and final grape variety that I'd like to highlight. So Cinemavro is pretty much the opposite of Ayurgitiko. So whereas Ayurgitiko is relatively easy to grow and makes quite attractive upfront wines, Cinemavro is often described as, as the diva of the Greek wine world. Um, but I truly believe that it doesn't just make Greek, Greece's best red wines, it makes some of the world's best red wines. It's an incredible variety. The name means sour black, which probably gives you a slight idea as to what the wine smells and tastes like. Um, but as I said, it is known as the diva. So it's difficult to grow, it's sensitive to arid conditions, it's sensitive to powdery and downy mildews, it's sensitive to botrytis, it's low in anthocyanins, so it typically is quite pale in colour. It suffers from potassium deficiencies, deficiencies which manifests itself as incredibly high acidity because potassium is alkaline um, and must be planted at around 4,000 vines per hectare. Pruning is essential and, you know, even when expertly handled, it can fail to reach phenolic and sugar ripeness. So it's, you know, it's Premier League stuff, but when done well, it can produce some of the most intensely aromatic, complex and structured red wines in the world. Sorry. <clears throat> Stylistically, a lot, of the, a lot of people say it's kind of between Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo. I'd, I'd say it's more towards Nebbiolo, certainly the best styles. Um, it's it's fragrant like Pinot Noir, but you know structurally it is it is incredibly tannic. I think there's I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I think it's got two or three times the number of pips as a normal Vitis vinifera grape, and so they lend lots of tannins. And um, Nelsa is arguably the finest area, um, which uh, is up in the north, which I'll show you in a minute. 
and this is a PDA which is 100% Cinemavro, um, whereas Rapsani, which I'll also mention in a minute, which is just on the south slopes of Mount Olympus, is typically blended with other grape varieties, but they're probably the two most famous and certainly between Wine Society members, well-known uh, PDOs for Cinemavro. Um, right. Other varieties just to just to look out for, just just so you all know that I'm, I'm thinking of them. Um, so white ones, Idani, uh, Hatsidakis on Santorini make an incredible Idani. Who knows? You might see that next year as well. Um, it makes wines a bit like, well, I think it's a bit like a Pellini Monroche, and you know, that's not bad, is it? Uh, there's Ethiri, Malagusia, Robola, which is the main white in Catalonia, which is where this picture is. Looks pretty nice, doesn't it? Um, Roditis, which is one of the grapes used to make Retsina, uh, which is mainly grown in the Patras PDO, which is in the northwest coast of the Peloponnese, which is a bit like Galicia there. It's very wet, wet and windy, but makes very nice white wines. And uh, Vidiano, which is one of the main white grape varieties of Crete. The red grape varieties to look out for, Limnio, Limniona, which is a little bit like Menthia, um, if anybody likes Menthia. Mavro Daphne, which is found again mainly on Cephalonia. Mavro Tragono, which I was tempted to talk a bit more in detail about because I think it makes some of the best red wines in Greece. Again, very full bodied, very rich, typically lots of new oak, very good. And Nagoshka, which is sometimes used as a blending component because it produces quite dark red wines. Uh, so we'll stop tour of grapes. Um, I won't go into much detail on appellations and classifications just because realistically, you know, it's probably not that interesting to most people. But what I will say is that um, it's very similar to the majority of European wine legislation. Um, so the two things to look out for are PDOs, um, which is protected designation of origin. And this is in essence kind of a historical wine growing regions of Greece. Uh, which is great, but also it does mean that quality and PDO doesn't necessarily go hand in hand, but is typically where you'll find native grape varieties produced uh, and they'll typically be of high quality. And wines under the PDO label must confirm to various requirements, including grape varieties, the percentage of those varieties used, maximum yields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the other is PGI, so Protected Geographical Indication, which is, you know, just like the French system, uh, which is a subcategory of table wine, um, and it's then broken up into three further bits, but we won't go into those. Um, PGI also includes Retsina, just to bring up Retsina again. <laughs> um, so there are two things to look out for on labels. Um, but rather than go too, too deep into the technicalities, I thought it'd be good to look at a few in a bit more detail. Um, because they do have affiliations with the grape varieties already mentioned. So we're back to Google Maps, my favorite thing in the world. Um, I can have a sip of wine. Mm. Very nice, I encourage you to have some wine as well. Right, so we're looking at Nemea here. So this is in the Peloponnese. So that little kind of offshoot at the bottom of mainland Greece. So if you can see my cursor, we're looking at the town of Nemea here, which is pretty much slap bang in the middle of the screen, if you can't see the arrow, which is a, not too far from Corinth. And then Athens is, is way to the east in Attica. Um, so this is a monovarietal PDO. So Aeorgitico is the main grape variety here. So if you see Nemea PDO on the label, it'll be Aeorgitico. Um, and both climate and terrain here is incredibly diverse, as you can probably see from, from that picture, um, thanks to the differing altitudes and aspects, thanks to this huge mountain range that, that comes straight down through the middle of it. Um, there are numerous different types of Adiogitico in terms of the style made. Typically it makes quite full bodied rich red wines, but you can make sweet wines, you can make sparkling wines, you can make Recciotto wines, you name it, but PDO, the best, is typically dry, 100% Um So yeah, as I said, Mitrovelis is lovely, and we've got their kind of up upper wine coming out later next year. Um, I'll just go back to that previous slide, actually, because 
I mentioned Mantinia, which is where um, the Moshka Filaro comes from, and that's basically here in the bottom left um, near Tripoli. So that's where, um, so Semeli are based in Nemea here, but their Moshka Filaro vines are down in Mantinia here. Um, we have sold their PDO Mantinia in the past, um, but as we're now supplying our Society Creek wine through them, I'm not buying it this year. Sorry, I know that there was a question about that, that's why. Um, so yeah, there's a picture of Nemea. Uh, it's pretty beautiful, as is, as is most of Greece, to be honest. Um, it looks a little bit like Piedmont, I think, um, with its hills, but uh, very different styles of wine to Piedmont. Um, okay, the next one that I thought we could talk a little bit more detail about is Nausa. Um, I'm sure that everyone here well, hopefully everyone here knows about Apostolos the Neopolis, uh, hugely, you know, massively favourite wine society producer, uh, makes amazing Cinemavro from Nausa. The town itself is just here on the left, um, and it is roughly 70 kilometres west of, of Thessaloniki, which is just over there, right on the slopes of Mount Vermeo, which is just to the south here. And this mountain range is, is hugely important for Nausa. As you can see, it almost curls up uh, around, up into North Macedonia here. Uh, and it's important because not only does it shelter it from the rain, but it also shelters Nausa from the incredibly strong northern winds which come blasting down um, and protects the vines there. And so typically on the slopes of Mount Vermeo, the vineyards are around 150 to 450 meters altitude. And there's no dominant soil here, which means that it's a real patchwork of different terroirs consisting of limestone, loam, sand, and as I mentioned earlier, clay, which makes quite intense, hardcore styles of Tsina Mavro because clay takes longer to, to warm up than other soils. And so ripening can be a lot slower. Um, so wines can struggle to get sugar and phenolic ripeness, but when they do, they make really impressive styles. Uh, soil fertility is very, very low in Nausa, and so yields are naturally restrictive, which is perfect for Tsinemavro. Um, and then obviously you see this massive fertile plain here. So most of the crops will be built, will be planted down there. And you can see there's access to the sea here. So that drags in loads of fog. And so there's often a lot of fog in and around Nausa. Whoops, sorry, which, um, which cools the area down. And there's quite an interesting discussion about Nausa in terms of the style of the Tsinemavro there. So as I mentioned, it is, uh, it's a monoculture um, vineyard area, so it's 100% Tsinemavro. Um, and so there's, a, there's an interesting discussion between the, the traditional and the modern. The traditional is typically picked a little bit earlier, um, higher acidity, a little bit more tannin. Um, I mean, the tannins in, in Tsinemavro are, are like powdery, when, when they're traditional um, and they really coat your mouth and they really dry your mouth out um, and lend a lot of structure to the wine, which, which I think is amazing. I think Cinemavro has possibly got the best tannins out of any grape on the planet. And then there's the more modern style, which is typically picked a little bit later. The wines have a little bit more sugar ripeness. The wines have a little bit softer, um, softer tannins. The wines typically spend a little bit longer in oak. Um, but Really, today, most producers have a kind of blend of the two, and Apostolos is definitely one of those. Um, and this fertile land here is, is believed to be where King Midas had his, his gardens, his, his productive gardens. So Apostolos is a little bit like Midas, I suppose, in that everything that he touches turns to gold, I think, anyway. Um, yeah, we do his Junvin, which is incredibly popular. Um, we do his Earth and Sky, which is from Nausa as well, which will come out next year, hopefully. Um, but also, um, we've got two new wines coming out in September from Nausa, which uh, you'll need to keep your eye out for because they are amazing. And they're more towards the traditional style as well. So I won't tell you who it is because that will spoil the surprise. But um, look out in September for some new Cinemavro because... We always get asked for it. Members seem to love it and you know, we're more than happy to, to get some new ones. I've got a picture of Nelsa coming up. 
lovely in green. That looks absolutely gorgeous. It looks a little bit like Jurassic Park, I think, but um, you know, that's just me. Um, God, we're rattling through. Um, okay, the next one probably best to talk about is Rapsani because I think it's one that a lot of members know about um, and it is, it's very important when it comes to Cinemavro. It does make wonderful examples. It's not 100% Cinemavro in Rapsani. It's blended with two different grape varieties called Stavrotto and Crosato. And Rapsani Town is basically right in between Mount Olympus here, which is basically right in the middle of the screen, and Mount Orsa just there. The town is basically right on where that E75 is, is there in that little gap, um, which again brings in, brings in the cool air from the sea. Um, so yeah, this is where Apostolos has his Rapsani vineyards. Um, and I find that Rapsani is typically a little bit richer, a little bit darker in colour because Stavrotto and Crosato are, are also added to give colour because Cinemavro is such a, a pale grape variety. Um, but yeah, some, some wonderful wines come from, from Rapsani. So I, if you haven't tried his Rapsani, give it a go. It's wonderful. Gosh, I'm going to be pretty much bang on 45 minutes. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, PBO wine space and Cinemavro, but often blended. And there's a picture of Rapsani there. So again, looks absolutely incredible. Right, Santorini. Um, gosh, Santorini is a weird place. Um, so it's located in the southern Aegean. Uh, it's about 120 miles southeast of Greece's mainland. Um, it's this little kind of backwards sea here. Um, it's the largest island of this kind of small circular archipelago. Uh, and it's the remnant of a volcanic caldera. So the island was the site of one of the largest volcanic eruptions in recorded history, the Minoan eruption, which occurred roughly 3,600 years ago. Uh, and this all but wiped out the Minoan civilization on Crete, um, or at least it's believed to, thanks to the massive tsunami that was created as a result. Um, but the last major eruption was all the way back in 1953, so uh, not that far ago. Um, this is Santorini from the air. I think we all are used to kind of seeing the gorgeous houses on the coastline of Santorini and don't really, well, I, I for one originally didn't quite know what Santorini actually looks like. And it's it's completely bonkers, isn't it? Um, so this obviously used to be, well, still is, I suppose, a massive volcano. Um, and uh, as the huge eruption, you know, all those years ago, happened it, it burst out so much magma that it basically the, the earth kind of gave away underneath um, and in came all this water that flooded the area so Santorini used to be about twice the size as it is now uh, this la this island here is actually the newest part of the island uh, which is about three four hundred years old and that's risen up um, again thanks to the kind of tectonic plates and and magma underneath um, viticulture long predates this eruption um, and Santorini has a history of constant cultivation since 1100 BC which is incredible for, for vineyards. Um, on the island there are 21 wineries, uh, there's 1100 hectares of vines and roughly 1000 vine growers of the 21,000 strong population so it's pretty crazy that pretty much one in 20 people on the island are grape growers and or winemakers, which is pretty amazing. As you can probably tell, it's a, a semi-arid climate with Mediterranean influences, but it experiences only 350 millimetres per year rainfall a year, which is tiny. I think the UK has on average uh, 1,200 millimetres a year, so hardly any rainfall whatsoever. And the land is predominantly volcanic volcanic sand with no organic matter, um, but it's very rich in minerals, um, low fertility, low in potassium. And so again, the wines of Santorini are typically very high in acidity and it's a phylloxera free zone. So phylloxera never came to Santorini. It's probably because of all the sand in the soils. Um, 
which means that there is some incredibly old vines in Santorini, incredibly old, hundreds of years. Um, the major difficulties with viticulture on Santorini are the incredibly strong winds and lack of rainfall, as already mentioned. Um, and so this is why you see these very famous kind of reef-like or almost kind of basket-shaped vines um, called colura. And these help shelter the grapes and the fruit from these brutal winds that, that sweep in and absolutely batter the vineyards. You can see how kind of desolate the, the rest of the land is around the vines um, whilst these still stay there. Um, and they also protect the vines from the sun. It can be very harsh sun here. Uh, and also they trap moisture. And so the fogs that roll in over Santorini in the morning obviously bring moisture. And these help kind of trap the, the what little moisture there is in there uh, and get the, get the vines some much needed moisture. Um, these vines go back, you know, their ancient history of using these vines. Um, and they're, they're basically created using what's called layering. Um, it's, it's often used quite a lot in Australia and other places like that, where they want to keep old vines. Um, basically, you'll take a large branch from one of the vines, stick it underground about 40 centimetres. You'll do that in the winter. And then come the next spring, probably two branches will stick up through the ground. Um, and then you'll use one of these to branch out and this will become your new vine. So it will be nurtured by the, the mother vine, but it will create its own root system. And so you can kind of keep your old vines going. Although to say that your vines are on average, however many years old, if you're doing that is, is slightly cheeky. Um, <clears throat> so the dry wines of the Santorini PDO must be a minimum of 75% Assyrtico, um, as I mentioned before, uh, with Aidani and Ethiri, the other main grape varieties used to blend. But most, most wines of the Santorini PDO, dry wines, are 100% Assyrtico. Yields are absolutely minuscule on the island, tiny. It's roughly 10 to 25 hectoliters per hectare on average. And I've, I've heard rumors, so I don't know if this is true or not, um, that some wineries over the last two years, it's been so difficult that they're down to about six hectoliters per hectare, which is bonkers. Um, so considering Grand Cru Burgundy Red is what, 35 to 37 hectoliters per hectare. Um, yeah, it's it's crazy. And so that gives you an idea as to, as to why a to go from Santorini can be astronomically expensive um, but the best ones are just incredibly weighty super rich and give this kind of citrus but also mineral and also beeswaxy um, I tried one not that long ago um, from Hatsidakis the Skitali which is one of the greatest white wines on the planet I think um, and it reminded me of um, Hunter Valley Semillon aged Hunter Valley Semillon, but obviously way more alcoholic. Um, Hunter Valley Semillon is about 10 and a half degrees. This is like 14 and a half, but it had that kind of lanolin, honeycomb, beeswax, just incredible um, complexity that is amazing considering it's a wine that doesn't see any oak. It, it tastes and is texturally like a wine that's been aged in oak, but it hasn't. Wonderful. Um, other major terms that is useful to people to know about are um, nicotari, uh, which basically is, is Santorini Assyrtico, but it's made using overripe grapes. Um, and these, must, these wines must be barrel fermented and they must spend at least three months in oak before release. And they've got a minimum alcohol of 13.5, which isn't difficult for Assyrtico. It's typically around 13 and a half, 14. Um, I don't think I've ever tried a nicotari, to be honest. It doesn't really sound up my street, uh, having been made from super overripe grapes, but who knows? Maybe I'll try one. Um, and also there's Vinsanto, which predates the Tuscan Vinsanto um, and technically has nothing to do with it, but it's also a naturally sweet wine um, made using sun-dried grapes. 
and aged for a minimum of two years in cask. Um, as I mentioned, Hatsadakis um, are a winery that we followed on Santorini for a number of years. Uh, I'm not too sure when we first started buying from them, um, but we try and buy from them as much as we can. Uh, I've, I've got two Asiticos from them coming next year. And also they, they do their Radani, which is, I think, wonderful. Um, God, that was an absolute whistle-stop tour. Uh, I apologize again. I'm sorry that we haven't really been able to cover other areas. Um, I know that there's more to Greece than just those kind of four great varieties and four regions, but hopefully, as we'll be doing more Zoom tastings, I'll be able to do um, slightly more specific ones, perhaps, um, and we'll be able to look a little bit more in detail and maybe taste along um, with some of the wines, because um, hopefully, hopefully, if you're not familiar with the wines of Greece, then hopefully that's given you an introduction as to where might be a good place to start. Um, but yeah, God, that flew by. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. That's very interesting. Um, I particularly enjoyed the maps. I, I too like a good topography map. Right. I, <laughs> love, I love Google Maps. It's genius. <laughs> It makes so much difference if you're learning about wine. First thing you it is good to be able to sort of get, place get where everything is. Satellites. It, it makes it make it makes so much sense. Absolutely. So we have had um, some questions coming in. Okay. Uh, so the first one is a question from um, Leah, and Leah, I think we're about to unmute you, um, so you can ask your question yourself. Uh, so let's just see, bear with me. Yeah, I think I'm good. Yeah, are you ready? Perfect. Let's Great. go ahead. Um, hi, Matthew. Um, I just have a question on um, classification. You'll probably hate me for this. Um, <laughs> as far as I'm aware, the legislation was put in place in about 1971 for the classification systems in Greece prior mm -hmm. to application for EU membership. Um, I just wondered, there's, there's been nothing since then, has there? Like it hasn't been updated or there hasn't been... Yeah, so I wondered, do you know, no. is, that, is that like imminently happening? Um, I'm particularly thinking about Kefalonia and um, Mavrodaphne, that, you know, it, it can't be classified as a, as a wine from that region because... So, there's, I just, as far as I'm aware, there's not, there's not been any changes further than PDO, PGI, etc. But it's been a, a gradual addition of areas to... PDOs, if that makes sense. And so they've been added over the years. I'm not too sure what's the most recent one or when that was, but um, as far as I'm aware, they're, they're still adding to them. If that answers your question, I think. Perfect. So did that answer your question there, Leah, or was there? Yeah, kind of. perfect, we've got a thumbs up, wonderful. The, um, <laughs> Yeah, because to, to be honest, like even as a as a like even looking up info on PDOs, PGIs in you know like Lazarakis's book, and even on the wines of Greece, it's not massively clear. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So I just wondered what you know. Did you know of anything that was going to happen kind of imminently, and in, in, in I suppose reclassifying or um, moving forward the way other countries have since the seventies. <laughs> Sadly, 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 no. I'm, I'm not, I'm not aware of that. But um, hopefully, once I get a chance to actually go out to Greece um, as a wine buyer next year, it's probably going to be. Then I'll be able to ask that question and see what the lowdown is on on future future videos. Great, thank you. No Lovely. So we've had some um, other questions um, about food matching and particularly the Gina Mavro. Um, so we were saying about how. The, the sort of the tannic structure of the of the wine there. So have you got any recommendations for Greek wine food matching in general or looking at the Gin um, very specifically? Probably diff difficult in general. Um, and, and even to be honest, the, the Cinemavro, as I said, kind of does come in a range of different styles. But um, as I said that the Thymiopolis wines, which we which we stock quite a few of at the moment, are typically slightly softer in tannins. And so I still think that they've got the structure that you you probably need some 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 meat or something relatively hefty to go with something with a little bit of fat so that those tannins can kind of 
clench onto something. Um, but, you know, plenty of Greek fodder as well, you know, um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's lots, there's lots that can go with it. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much. Certainly like the Jeune Vigne is, is a relatively light style and will go with all sorts of your vegetarian fodder. Um, but I, I, I very much liked um, Giuseppe Vira's um, answer the other week, which was, you know, the best, best thing is, is, is good company rather than don't think about the food, think about the company. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'd be eating it with, with, with some steak personally, because certainly the more traditional styles have got the tannin that needs something quite hefty. Um, but yeah, lightly. The, um, tasting's point of view. Yeah. It is the, um, the Jim Bean, the Gina Mavro is actually quite a um, popular one that we've used at a lot of the members' lunches. Mm -hmm. And we've used it with a lot of tomato-based um, yeah. dishes. So if anyone is quite a big fan of tomatoes, if the warm yeah. weather has done your tomato crop well, that might be something to look yeah, into definitely. there. Gina Mavro often has flavours of sun-dried tomato. Um, mm. It's quite a distinctive flavor characteristic for it and so yeah anything with sun-dried tomatoes would be would be perfect as well uh, so we've got a question uh, about um the vineyard sites in santorini and whether they're all uh, planted in the basket style i can't speak for everyone but i i i i believe the the very vast majority are are planted using the, the basket system just because it's the wind is so harsh there that they get thoroughly battered <laughs> um mm. so as far as, as far as i'm aware again i've not had a chance to actually go out there and, and view in person but i think it would take a, a brave vineyard on not to have have that have that style yeah there's a nice practical method for use yeah. um oh we're back on the uh little bit back against the, the Gina Mavro and it's whether we will be having the Rosé Gina Mavro back at all. Is that something? Uh, maybe. I see Leah laughing there as well. <laughs> I, know that, I know that she's very keen on the Rosé. Um, I don't I don't know, to be honest. I, I've got a sample of the latest release downstairs, which I haven't had a chance to open yet. I probably should have opened it today. Um, I know that we have had stop, have, have stopped them in the past. Um, it's, it's quite, yeah, it's quite a I find it quite a difficult style of rosé. You know, it's 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 pretty hardcore. It's not your sit by the pool rosé, nor that nor should it be. Um, it's a it's a pretty hardcore style. But once I tried the sample downstairs, I know that he makes it in tiny quantities and sells it everywhere apart from the UK, pretty much. And so it's difficult to get hold of. But if if I like the sample, then I'll then I'll try and get some in. Absolutely. And are you able to tell us um, any more about the society's own label Greek wine that we'll be seeing in the next couple of weeks? Uh, yeah. There's a little sneak preview at all yeah. on that. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering what else I can say. So it's made by Sinelli. Um, it's 55% Moshka Filaro and 45% Roditis. Um, and it's it's similar. If, if, if people have tried the... Uh, the Mantinia PDO um, Moshka Filaro from them before. It's not dissimilar to that. It's a little bit lighter, probably, but it's but Roditis gives quite a lot of acidity to Moshka Filaro, which which it lacks in a little bit of body. Um, but uh, yeah, it's delicious. Um, Freddie actually blended it when he was out in Greece right at the start of the year. Um, I. Didn't get a chance to go out, unfortunately, but I had samples sent over and confirmed the thermal final sample, and it is, it's really good. It's kind of perfect summer wine. So, I think it's being released on the, I want to say, sixteenth of July, um, or something like that. But there's loads of it, so we won't run out. Don't worry. Excellent. And just from um, a curious question for myself, in terms of the labelling, have we gone down the typical sort of floral society labelling that we seem to be? going with at the moment is it going to be yeah it's it's not it's not dissimilar to the um probably like the hungarian society's hungarian white um which we're actually not doing anymore sorry um <laughs> it's not it's not dissimilar to that you know it's got it's got the things that people would recognize about greece so i think it's got the yeah. The, the Acropolis in the back, or the Parthenon, I can never remember which one's which, um, and uh, some, you know, floral styles. So it's better than some of the labels. It looks good. 
Excellent. So if people can't get to Greece this year for a holiday, then they can have it from the bottle in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> Go on, <Google> Maps. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Go on Google Maps and pour yourself a glass of wine. <laughs> so I think that is um, it in terms of questions. If anyone does have any questions that sort of come to them after this, um, do let us know and we can um, avoid them on to you, Matthew, and we can get an answer for you. Yeah, um, but I think all is left to really say, so thank you very much for joining us um, again. Do t check out the Tastings calendar for what else we have got coming up. Um, you will hopefully have all received a notification of our wine champions offer and you'll be able to then um, see on the tasting calendar that we've got a very packed um, rota of, of champions producers so do check that out thank you very much Matthew that was um, an excellent presentation and uh, yes. <laughs> have a lovely evening everybody thanks everyone thank you bye bye bye